Mentorship does not always mean that you're going to be friends forever. In fact, many teachers discourage close relationships in teaching. They are somewhat removed. I happen to enjoy making friends. Watching students find their own voice, seeing that they understood what I was teaching them, watching them develop their own skills, that was a great, great satisfaction. My first teaching job was at the Worcester Museum School. This was after my military service. Then I was offered a job at Buffalo. It was then the University of Buffalo. And I stayed there until 1999. So it was 41 years in Buffalo and one year in Worcester. I enjoyed it. I liked communicating with people and I liked helping them if I could. In the old days, it was not uncommon for a teacher to come into a classroom pick up a brush and work on a student's canvas or a student's drawing. And I remember very clearly one young lady put me in my place and said, you have no right to work on my work. And I realized that she was right, although it was painful to realize that. So I would, from that time on, I would either ask permission or I would do a demonstration on a separate surface. At the graduate level, I had to think conceptually along with the student. I had to understand what their, where they were coming from, and invariably where they were coming from reflected what they understood about what was going on in the world of art that appealed to them, that informed them. Just as I was informed by abstract expressionism, they might have been informed by pop art, uh, geometric art, realism, um, social comment, political comment. And if I didn't under quite understand what the student was doing, or if I thought I couldn't help them, particularly at the graduate level, I would invite them to find somebody who could. I would never try to dissuade them or to change their minds particularly. Rather, what they were doing would be my clue as to how to proceed with my comments about their work. You have to find common ground, you have to find a way to communicate, but you don't have to live together or be friends for, for life, necessarily, unless it just happens. When I got to Buffalo and I saw the collection at the Albright Knox Art Gallery of Abstract Expressionists, this was in 1958, that was a major turning point for me. And I turned my back on what my roots had been and decided to become an abstract painter without having had any contact with the abstract expressionists or abstract painting uh, at all. On some occasions I have gone back to realism just to see if I could still do it and I can but the pull of abstraction is so strong that ultimately I'm very comfortable working in that way. This is a book which I created with facsimiles of drawings that I did when I was in the service in Korea in 1952. And these were done from the individuals who sat for me 
and they, over the years, they have yellowed and uh, started to self-destruct. Here are examples of 1961 or two of what I was doing at that time. An early form of abstract expressionism. This is a serograph or a silk screen. And uh, I cut the patterns myself and applied them to the silk screens and then uh, actually did the prints. This period of time, which was the late 70s, early 80s, during which I did geometric abstraction. And at some point, I just came to a dead end in terms of having experimented as much as I cared to within this, uh, within this approach. And um, I felt that, that I had something else to say that was perhaps more physically expressive. I had a show, I was still teaching, and I had a, I had a show at the University Art Galleries. And, um, and I, produced, <laughs> I produced these paintings on the floor. I had a studio in Buffalo. As you can see, they're enormous, but you can see some of the, the loose, free paint structure and, and form that led to the broader imagery that I'm working with now. And my heirs are going to have to deal with them. 1958 to, to, to today, almost 60 years of work, six decades. With some trepidation, I take a chance and I dive in and I pour the paint. Then I use a squeegee, which is made of dense foam, quarter inch foam, which is wrapped around a wooden form and in some cases is notched so that I get striations, linear striations, rather than just a continuous smooth surface. And I begin to work based on specific reference. Once I begin to work, the canvas or the paper takes over. I'm no longer totally in control of what the next step is. And at some point, something tells me to stop and to reflect and to see what I've done. Now I can work wet into wet You look at your work and you say, I can change this, or I can leave it and do another work. Well, I might be able to improve it, but chances are I might spoil it. So do I want to take that chance? Do I want to lose some of the freshness? Do I want to lose some of the immediate excitement that I had in seeing the strokes of the squeegee and the, the distribution of color and the and the unexpected blending of color that creates third and fourth colors, do I want to risk creating mud? That's the biggest risk in working this way. And that's all I would do on this surface. As far as I'm concerned, it's complete because if I continue, I am going to make mud. However, having said that, I have to decide now whether I like this or whether I want to change it.
I don't think I would gain anything further by adding more color or more form. So I'm going to leave it. And now begins the process of cleaning up. So my work was eclectic for a number of years and it took a long time for me to find my own voice and it's still informed by abstract expressionism but I believe it's my own idiosyncratic form of abstraction and I'm constantly reinventing or inventing based on that school of, of art.